My this name is conference Eric. will now be recorded. My name is Eric Jarvis. I'm professor of neurobiology and genomics at the Rockefeller University and also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, I also have the uh, title as chair of the Genome 10K uh, Vertebrate Genomes Project. And I've been asked uh, to talk today about that project. And uh, um, and uh, the, uh, the progress is we have made uh, since we've uh, begun. And I've, actually, I've been asked to talk about this for the past several years, but uh, haven't been able to uh, make it. Uh, and now, uh, you know, with the shutdown and everything, uh, it's, it's easy actually to, to, to talk to you more at length about it. So, my advance is not working. Okay, I'll just do it here by hand. So, here we go. Um, so, I broke my presentation down into three parts here motivation for the project, uh, development of what we're calling uh, heuristic, you know, let, let's say euphemistically, platinum quality genomes, and a plan for what we're now titling the Vertical Genomes Project. So, the history behind the Vertical Genomes Project uh, uh, really begins with. Uh, the Genome 10K organization it start, itself, started by Oliver Ryder, Stephen O'Brien, David Hauser back in 2009. When next generation sequencing technology started to come online, including from uh, PacBio and others, uh, <clears throat> there was a uh, excitement uh, in the scientific community that it wasn't going to take, you know, years of efforts and millions of billions of dollars per genome but it, hopefully eventually one day there would be a thousand dollar genome and uh, we can do genomes at scale. Uh, and so these three uh, folks, plus a number of folks you see here as the founding attendees at a meeting in 2019, started one of the first major um, large scale uh, genome projects of let's say complex organism, vertebrates in this case. Uh, and they uh, published a proposal to obtain Full genome sequences for 10,000 vertebrate species in 10 years. And there are a number of um, interesting success stories coming out of this. There was an assembly -thon competition to try to get the best assembly, uh, uh, de novo assembly, that is, uh, from short reads at that time. Because before this time, Sanger reads were being used, which was in the 700 uh, uh, base pair range. And these were 35 to 100 base pairs long. Uh, there was an assembly -thon two. Uh, that uh, use some vertebrate species, uh, use some real D DNA um, data as opposed to semithon one, and a linothon competition because we knew that there were problems with uh, alignments of these whole genomes. And uh, there was the first initiative with uh, good funding from VGI to uh, fund the first 101 genomes. And one of the collaborative projects that came out of that was what we're calling the Avian Phylogenomics Consortium. Uh, with myself, Goji Zhang, and Tom Gilbert, who led this effort, who took some of the G10K genomes from that 101, as well as others that we uh, got support for ourselves, and sequenced the genomes of an additional 45 bird species beyond the 48, I mean, three that was sequenced at the time, the uh, zebra finch, uh, the turkey, and the uh, uh, chicken. And uh, one of the goals here was uh, myself was interested in the vocal learning species, songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds here, because uh, they have the ability to imitate sounds like us, and many other birds and non-human vertebrates can't do that. And um, I also made sure we included non-vocal learning close relatives according to different phylogenetic trees in the literature, because there were different publications throughout decades arguing that uh, or switching around the relationships of all these different birds in the family tree, using different genes or morphology and so forth. And we wanted to know uh, what was the correct tree? Are these vocal learners closely related to each other? Do they have one common ancestor or they independently evolved? And the same thing for other traits, loss and gain of flight and so forth. So um, uh, we wanted to see if we can get the tree right, not just by using individual genes, but the whole genome. And, uh, from that effort, using uh, mostly short read uh, genome sequences, there were roughly uh, 50 papers that came out over a two-year period in 2014 and 16. Uh, 
eight in the special issue of science and uh, focus on lots of things from genetics, trait evolution, uh, reptile uh, genomics, and so forth, and genome evolution. And uh, one of the uh, uh, published patients that came out in is that we did create a family tree from these genome scale uh, data sets. Uh, and so here is a tree I had been using uh, for 15 years before that study, where it argued in red here that the vocal learning bird groups evolved these uh, behavior in these colored yellow and red brain structures independently from a common ancestor uh, that they had. So the three red dots here. Or there could have been a common ancestor back here and you had these multiple losses, or maybe everybody has it to various degrees, um, but uh, that, uh, that you know, it's been independently amplified in the songbirds, hummingbirds, and parrots, or something as a neuroscientist I didn't appreciate, maybe the tree is wrong. So what kind of tree did we get? Uh, this was based upon DNA hybridizations, this one showed here. All right, so looking at the old tree versus the new tree uh, that we got from whole genomes, there are a lot of rearrangements in the relationships of species in this tree. Uh, the vocal learners were separated. Actually, the hummingbirds were even pulled further apart from the uh, songbirds and the parrots, indicating there are three independent games. Uh, so, so lots of rearrangements, and that was very useful. Uh, and what about the actual uh, brain pathways for controlling this behavior? We found convergent gene regulation uh, between different parts of the songbird brain here that control imitation of sounds with different parts of the human brain, like laryngeal motor cortex, the anterior part of the basal ganglia, that controls speech. And that we could not find this up or down regulation of these specialized genes that control neural connectivity in the uh, non-vocal learning birds or non-human primates. Uh, and this was assisted by having these whole genomes. So we were really excited by these findings. And uh, we took several candidate genes, like one called SLIT1, an axon guidance ligand that controls neural connectivity, and proved that it is downregulated. You know, the messenger RNA signal here is in white, and it's turned off in these vocal learning circuits of these three independent lineages, but not in the non vocal learning dove and quails. Uh, and in humans, we found downregulation in the laryngeal motor cortex regions that control speech uh, that are precisely located in the regions that control that speech production, uh, this is data from uh, uh, Eddie Chang's group that uh, putting electrodes in human brains and showing that this area in red here are the areas of highest speech production neural activity. And those are precisely the regions that we found the gene regulation changes that are converging with these song learning birds. So we're all excited. Wow, these genomes are really helping us out, make these novel discoveries. Now we want to go and interrogate the function of these genes individually or many genes at once because there are like 50 genes per brain region that were converging. And my lab and many other labs begin to discover with these uh, uh, next generation sequencing genomes that they're highly fragmented. Here you can see this is actually a Sanger based assembly of one of these genes called the zebra finch. Uh, all these different contigs here with different gaps and looking at those gaps we're finding that they're missing parts of genes. Uh, many of these genes were actually incorrectly assembled. Uh, their biologically meaningful repetitive regions were misassembled or not assembled at all. Uh, this is causing many months to clone to correct gene structure just for one gene. Uh, some of my students were taking almost a half a year to a year to get the correct gene structure across all these species from these new genomes. And realizing that people are starting to work with artifactual gene structure and sequence, unknowingly making false conclusions about the biology, uh, and causing lots of problems, excuse me. So, so uh, <clears throat> the leaders of the G10K organization asked me to help out with uh, more uh, effort on the uh, Genome 10K project uh, with the success we learned from the avian phylogenomics project. And so instead of diving initially into sequencing more species with these uh, short read approaches, uh, we decided to spend a number of years beginning in 2015 to try to develop higher quality genome assemblies so we have good data on the front end that saves time on the back end uh, with these kinds of analyses. So the second part of my talk, I titled it Platinum Quality Genomes, and it's the longest part because it's the most uh, that we've made progress on in the last few years. 
So it was actually Jonas Korlek at PacBio who approached me and says, Eric, I think you can do better. Uh, can you just send us samples from one species uh, that you worked on that you're excited about and we will sequence the, uh, that individual animal. And that led to studies on the hummingbird. Uh, one of the vocal learning species, it's a, we took a female to get the heterogeneic sex. It has a relatively small genome for a vertebrate one gigabase size. Uh, and it's a vocal learner, it imitates sounds, despite a small brain like we humans do. And that led to us taking this one animal that we had generated uh, next generation short read assembly in the avian phylogenomics project uh, to not only have this Illumina data, but 10x genomics data, pack bio, nanopore, uh, bio nano optical maps of various different enzymes approaches, dovetail genomics of Chicago and high C libraries, uh, phase genomics, high C, aroma genomics, uh, high C data, as well as NR gene and, and more. Uh, spanning all different kinds of insert length sizes, sequence uh, uh, base pair uh, read sizes, uh, and so on. Uh, presumably whole chromosomes with the high C data. And um, before I get into all the details, I want to give a big shout out to Arang Ray, who is a postdoc in Adam Phillips group at NIH, uh, where she has really done a tour de force effort in pulling all the data together that we had accumulated on this one hummingbird and other species that I'll tell you about in a minute. And uh, she herself had done also 250 assemblies on this hummingbird data, testing, testing out as many different combinations of these data sets as possible. And so uh, the first lesson uh, that we learned from her and other people's analysis is that long reads are more contiguous and more accurate uh, in assembly structure than all short read approaches. So here, uh, showing a subset of those assemblies with this dashed line breaking the division between short read assemblies and the N contig NG50 values, that is the N50 measured according to the genome size given the sequence data, uh, and the uh, N50 values from all data sets that included long reads. It's like night and day. There's just no difference. Um, I mean, there is just no, um, you know, uh, uh, let's say gray zone here. Uh, and further, we learned that um, that the only thing that would improve the N50 contact further was just adding longer reads, or uh, there are some fixes the algorithms that we helped out with, uh, for example, Falcon Unzip was um, causing some uh, sequences not to join together that should be joined together that was either sequence errors or haplotype errors. Once we worked with PacBio to fix that, the N50 contact went even further up from four gigabases, a million base pairs, sorry, to 12. Uh, second lesson here is that uh, the N50 scaffolding uh, wasn't so much affected by the long read. It's true, uh, the long read assemblies with uh, using scaffolding approaches tend to have higher, slightly higher NG50s than the short reads, uh, but this didn't, it didn't matter as much as the actual contents with, without gaps. Uh, <clears throat> here though, when you look at the gaps, uh, there is once again a striking difference. All the short read assemblies had anywhere from 18,000 to 70,000 gaps of, uh, in, in these uh, scaffolds, whereas all the long read based assemblies had uh, much fewer gaps. Um, the zero here means that this wasn't, the CLAR data wasn't scaffolded. Uh, so uh, here we have up to roughly three to 4,000 gaps in some assemblies and 400 in others. The ones that gave the, uh, the, the most complete assemblies once we curated and then uh, had what we considered a, a truth set, um, uh, many of these assemblies also result in many misjoins in the scaffolding process, uh, but the long read assemblies have much fewer misjoins than the, uh, uh, the uh, short read assemblies. So, uh, so this said to us going forward, we must use long reads uh, for all these different uh, data types. Now, what we, I mean, all the, for assemblies going forward. Now, the, this, for the scaffolding approaches, the optical mapping and the high C data plus the linked reads gave what we considered the most accurate assembly. And that's shown here uh, in the evaluation of these assemblies from Kirsten House Group at Sanger. Uh, using this high C data, uh, mapped back to the scaffolds, we can see that uh, we have very good structural consistency 
uh, cross, there's only one in this picture here, um, uh, scaffold that should really broken down into two chromosomes of what we think. And some others off the diagonal here, some uh, small scaffolds that should be grouped with these uh, bigger ones, which Kirsten's group fixed. And, uh, and when she did that, she basically found that, uh, you know, the combination of all four scaffolding technologies and the long reads together gave the best quality data. And, and how further do we evaluate that? Marley's hooks group at the San Diego Zoo had been doing lots of karyotyping of all these different species. And Martin Pipple of uh, Gene Meyer's group had developed an algorithm that can take these images of the karyotype here, measure their predicted sizes in the chromosomes, and we then uh, correlated those sizes with the sizes of these high C generated designated chromosomes. And there's a nearly one to one correlation with the predicted sizes of these chromosomes and these scaffolds generated by this VGP pipeline. So, uh, so that means we have a complete chromosomes, but complete doesn't necessarily always mean complete. And so what the wrong did is uh, put these chromosomes and uh, ask, uh, are, does any of them have evidence of collapse repeats? That is, uh, actually some of these chromosomes, there's just one gap in them for this chromosome 14 of the hummingbird. So it's, it's almost telomere telomere. Uh, but so Iran took all the different data types, the CLAR data, the 10X, the optical maps, high C and so forth, and asked, is there any evidence of collapses? And you can see where I have these arrows on both sides. Some of the small microchromosomes here, these are all the chromosomes of the hummingbird. Uh, and, and in the middle of some of the big chromosomes, we have evidence of collapse repeats or low coverage. But some of these, like chromosome 14, have just one or two sites or none at, at all for some of these different data types, indicating that they're practically complete. We didn't find telomeres at the end of this chromosome, and we think, but the telomeres are actually in the raw data. We think with just the issues of actually removing repetitive sequences in the beginning of the assembly didn't allow us to assemble the telomeres. But in the absence of the telomeres, we're going all the way across with one gap uh, with no evidence of collapse repeats around that gap. So we're, this is pretty good. Um, so, uh, so then what we decided to do, well, that was just one species, the hummingbird. What about uh, other species? Not every genome is the same. And so we applied our best pipeline that we got to work on the hummingbird across 16 species. And that pipeline was to take uh, the PacBio long reads, uh, then link them up with the 10X uh, data, uh, using a scaffolding, not necessarily de novo assembling of these 10X data. Uh, then take the optical maps here in purple and link up those scaffolds together and, and make any kind of corrections that's needed. And then take high C uh, data and then go at, uh, link those scaffolds up together. So basically going from shorter to longer range data. And then gap fill with uh, arrow and polish also with arrow to correct for base pair errors in the pack bio data using 10x data. And then in curation, uh, look for any misassembly, any misjoins or any inversions and correct them. And inform the assembly team what errors have been made so we can improve the algorithms here. And here is um, uh, the 16 species that we've looked at from bats to the Canada lynx, a, a cat, the platypus, uh, the zebra finch, we did that over again. We chose actually an uh, individual that was used for the prior reference as a Sanger based assembly, uh, the zigzag eel, a number of fish genomes here. And here I'm just uh, uh, giving credit to the folks who uh, helped lead the uh, genomes for effort for these various species. This was an international collaborative effort. It wasn't just a few people uh, doing this project. And what you can see here is that the CLIR data length uh, roughly in the 10 to 20 kb, up to also 60 kb for some uh, data sets. Uh, and the linked reads are the next longest molecules. They're a paired end, uh, that, I mean, linked molecules across the molecule, uh, linked short reads across the molecule. And then the optical map and then the high C data, which is paired end, going out to um, uh, you know, 10 to 20 million to 100 million almost, a base pair range for the optical maps. And here is uh, one of those uh, data sets uh, assembled, uh, going from contigs, purging, false duplications, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, using 10x data to scaffold, bio nano, high C, 
polished with arrow and gap fill to pre-base polishing to final curation. And you can see the contig NG50 uh, from the initial pack bio contig and doesn't change that mu much. A little tiny bump that's hard to see uh, with the arrow gap filling. Uh, but the scaffold N50 continuously increases as we get to uh, more and more uh, uh, scaffolding approaches. And final curation uh, leads to a further increase with some corrections. Uh, and this is Tanya Lama with her advisor, uh, who helped out with the Canada Lynx genome. So how are these assemblies doing compared to the old assemblies? Well, here um, is uh, what we call chromosome ideograms from Joanna Domus and Harris Lewin's group, comparing the old zebra finch uh, a Sanger based assembly here in these colors on the right to the new assembled uh, annotated chromosomes of the new BGP assembly. And if there was a perfect um, match between the old and the new, the color of the old here would match the color of the new, and you would see consistent uh, um, assembly uh, matching from the old assembly to the new. By the way, the old Zebra Finch assembly with the Stengler used genetic karyotype mapping to, uh, to assign chromosomes. Genetic karyotype mapping was not used for the new, it was the high C data. So, uh, what do we see here? We see that chromosome one in the old assembly uh, versus the new actually uh, is really consisting of two chromosomes in the old assembly. That is, chromosome one and one B, relative to chicken, that is. It was thought that chromosome one was three chromosomes in the zebra finch. We said, no, that's not true. It's really two chromosomes. One and one B should belong together. And we have single pack bio reads going across uh, what used to be a gap uh, in the old assembly and optical map and high C data support this. Uh, what was called a linkage group wasn't certain it was a chromosome or not. We, uh, we identified it as a real chromosome and gave it a new designation, chromosome 29. Uh, we also find, even though um, we're not getting telomeres in all these assemblies, we're getting in some of them, that the ends of these chromosomes where there's white uh, uh, gaps here are now longer in the VGP-based assembly. These were getting more sequences that at the repetitive regions that were missed in the Sanger-based assembly in the past. Another newly identified chromosome 30, which I'll come back to a little later. What about the platypus? Also a Sanger-based assembly assigned chromosomes based upon fish karyotype mapping. And compared to the old assembly, it's like, wow, this new assembly is adding a lot more sequence not present in the old assembly. So all this white space you see here uh, in the new assembly was not present in the assembled chromosomes of the pre previous plat platypus reference. Uh, and uh, further, uh, we have uh, basically a rearrangement of, in the assembly. And so the old chromosome three, a part of it really belongs to chromosome two. Uh, old chromosome four, a piece of that actually goes to a new chromosome or designating chromosome 14. Uh, and uh, old chromosome 14 is really a sex chromosome, uh, part of X chromosome two, we're bringing two pieces of the old assembly together. And we got roughly six to seven new chromosomes here, uh, plus uh, uh, um, a complete chromosome Z, almost a complete chromosome Z, and 10 sex chromosomes in the platypus, not all of them were identified in the previous assembly. To be fair, the old assembly was of a female, so we had the five X chromosomes of the, of the platypus from before and a newly added one um, that wasn't there. Uh, we knew there were five, but they couldn't figure out what X4 was. And since we did a male, we got the Y chromosomes as well. Uh, another thing to note here is that uh, th what this suggests, oh yeah, it's another thing is that you see these, uh, these lines going through these chromosomes. Whenever you see a change in the direction, it means that this was an inversion error relative to the old assembly. So for a number of these chromosomes, we fixed the orientation as well of the uh, chromosome contigs uh, relative to the old assemblies. So this is much better. We, we, this, I, this is some of my own favorite figures here, not my own, my personal favorite figures from Joanna and others, uh, because this really tells you how much of an improvement we're making based upon the previous so-called platinum references. Okay, uh, those are ones where we had genetic mapping uh, in the past. What about 
the chromosomes where there wasn't genetic mapping on the old assemblies, like the hummingbird, but didn't have fish or genetic karyotyping mapping. And what we did here is we took the 10 top scaffolds of the old assembly and mapped them back to the new designated chromosomes of the new assembly. And then everything that was below um, that, that's those top 20, that is, uh, everything else uh, we colored in gray here. And you can see that the old assembly is quite fragmented compared to this new assembly. Uh, multiple of the top 20 scaffolds fit within uh, the, the new chromosomes here. Uh, but mo you can see that most, most of this new assembly is, is colored by red and gray, meaning that the sequences are there in the old assembly. They're just not put together that well. They're, it's fragmented. Uh, what about the platypus, uh, or I mean, uh, another, sorry, uh, species, the climbing perch, a fish genome that also had an old reference without any kind of karyotype mapping. Uh, we can see here that this old assembly is extremely fragmented. There are tens of thousands of small scaffolds here. Uh, we, we had to even set a limit cutoff as to what scaffolds were allowed to map back to the new VGP assembly. Uh, and the top 20 are, are still quite small. And further, there's a lot of uh, sequence here that we got into the new assembly that's not even present in any scaffolds or contigs in the old assembly, it just never made it into the assembly. So, uh, and fish genomes are much more repetitive than many other species. So uh, this is maybe one of the reasons why. Uh, we can also see here, uh, we got both sex chromosomes for avian genomes for the first time, or at least for focal learning species. And this one sex chromosome, the W, wasn't even in the assembly at all from the previous assembly, even though it was the same hummingbird, the same animal. Uh, what about other types of chromosomes? Uh, the organelle genomes. So Giulio Fermenti in my group, a postdoc, um, has been analyzing the mitochondrial genomes. And we find that uh, with the PAC bio-based falcon assembly, uh, a proportion of them have the mitochondrial genomes, uh, and many others did it. And we found that this was due to sides cut off of the library or sides cut off of the um, P reads when you start to assemble. Uh, the mitochondrial genome is anywhere from 15 to 20 kb long. Uh, and uh, if you do a size fractionation for your initial assembly of, of fragments of greater than 20 kb, you miss the mitochondrial reads. So what uh, Julio developed was a mitochondrial BGP pipeline that use reference data to pull out the mitochondrial reads and then assemble them separately. And he was able to get mitochondrial assemblies from almost all of these, these 16 uh, uh, species. And he found for at least half of them, compared to the old references of so-called complete mitochondria for some, some of these species, that the BGP assemblies were always bigger, or for, not always bigger, but for about half of them, they're bigger, uh, compared to the current references in gene bank. And this is a statistical difference. Uh, and we find that what is causing these BGP assemblies to be bigger is that a number of these mitochondrial genomes have real duplications in them, uh, like the control region or tRNA genes uh, that weren't seen in the so-called complete assembly. And they're not false duplications because we can find single molecule pac reads, also high C data and so, not high C, but 10X data going through uh, these uh, duplications here. And further, we found some individual PAC bio reads that went through the entire mitochondrial genome several times around, showing the duplications really exist. Uh, so this is adding some new biology to understanding uh, mitochondrial uh, chromosomal organization and function. So uh, the next lessons we've learned that repeats and heterozygosity are major issues for assembly whether it be long reads or short reads. And here's some of the evidence from that, beginning with the collaboration uh, that I have with Jonas Korlak on the um, zebra finch genome. We can see um, one of our favorite genes, DUS1. One, it's a gene that's upregulated uh, here in the white signal, the mRNA product, when these songbirds sing in their vocal learning circuits of the brain. Uh, but when they're hopping and doing other motor behaviors, you don't see upregulation of this gene in the brain here. This is the front of the brain, the back of the brain. This is the tissue section showing regulation of the gene after singing behavior. So we found by single molecule cloning in the past with Sanger sequencing 
that in the vocal learning species, this gene has a highly repetitive sequence in its promoter regulatory region, which made it hard to assemble. Uh, and uh, what Jonas helped us figure out compared to the prior Sanger-based assembly, we're seeing that these repetitive regions had gaps in them in the prior Sanger and Illumina-based assembly. And uh, when we uh, sequenced uh, using packed biodata, we found that this gene actually can find single molecule reads that are going through these repetitive promoter regions, uh, but they were initially assembled uh, basically together. The two different haplotypes were divergent enough from each other, from repeat one versus repeat two, that the assemblers were putting them together uh, with gaps in between instead of separating them out into two different haplotypes. And we can prove this because we found single molecule reads going through each haplotype. Um, and so taking that lesson, um, here's what we learned from the 16 genome. First, we learned that um, uh, NG50 is correlated with genome size. The bigger the genome, the bigger your chromosomes. Uh, so uh, that can uh, inflate your perception of NG50. So when you think about how your NG50 scaffold size is, is it really good? Uh, you might want to normalize it to the size of the genome as well to really compare apples to apples. The, here we find that uh, the more repeats, some of these genomes like the skate had close to 60% of its genome was repetitive sequence. Uh, and the, uh, the more repetitive sequence a genome had, uh, the, the uh, lower the NG50 contig value. Uh, meaning repeats, it's hard to uh, to determine. Uh, repeats, by the way, was measured, it's hard to actually assemble. Uh, repeats was measured by a new algorithm uh, Ryan has called Mercury that uses the actual raw sequence data to measure the repeat content of the genome uh, and also duplication and, and other types of real duplication. So uh, the number of gaps we found is uh, directly also correlated with the repeat content. That is, the greater the repeat content of the genome, the more gaps we have in our assemblies between contigs. Uh, also, heterozygosity that I just told you about uh, between different haplotypes. The greater the heterozygosity, the bigger the genome size of the primary assembly. And why is that the case? Well, we predict this is because some of these genomes are getting above the predicted uh, size of the actual genome itself, bigger than 100%. That is this due to false duplication? The other haplotype being put into the primary assembly. And so here, uh, a diagram that Arang and others uh, worked on uh, to explain what we think is going on. In the assembly, you get highly homozygous regions uh, next to highly heterozygous regions forming a bubble. Uh, and that bubble then, uh, upon contagging with Falcon or other software, is being broken into two. Uh, where one haplotype stays with one uh, homozygous sequence and the other with the other, or you separate them to two separate contigs where one haplotype is a contig by itself that just stays in the primary assembly. And then when we go to scaffold with the various scaffolding tools, the scaffolders uh, recognize these sequences look similar. They should belong together, but they don't quite line up, so we'll put a gap in there. Uh, and similarly, um, <clears throat> Also, what happens is that if you have some sequencing error with the red dots here, or a, or a contig boundary, which is hard to separate because of, of some divergence in the sequence, uh, could be also sequence errors, uh, and then you start to scaffold, you get the similar kind of mistakes where uh, due to sequencing errors, these um, contigs can then be put together as separate uh, uh, scaffolds or separate contigs, or uh, with the gap in between. So uh, purge haplotags, an algorithm actually developed in one of the initial parent genomes the Genome Content Case Consortium worked on was developed uh, and to recognize these uh, false duplications uh, that were separate haplotags and, and remove them. But in the BGP um, uh, genomes, we started to recognize there are these other types of false duplications with gaps in them on the same scaffold. So uh, Guan and others from Richard Durbin's group, Deng Feng Guan, uh, developed what we call purge dupes to remove those as well. And, uh, and I just want to show you some examples that how big these false duplications can get. 
uh, particularly with long reads that get bigger. Uh, so here is a, what we call a non-trio based assembly, it's assembly based on the individual animals, and we have trio data that is from the parents of this uh, zebra finch here. And we find that uh, doing a self-alignment of this chromosome against itself, you see these off-diagonal molecules that are big giant duplications here and here is a big giant duplication of each other, greater than one million base pairs. And when Iran looked at the um, parental data mapped to this uh, 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 child here, found that they were switching between haplotypes in red and blue here, and there was a gap between this large duplication, uh, indicating that not only it's a false haplotype duplication, but even within the haplotypes, there is um, switching back and forth uh, within the duplication between haplotypes. And here is another duplication, haplotype duplication, next to this big duplication. Uh, so we call those heterotypic duplications. Here, this type we call a homotypic duplication due to a false um, duplication of a, of a poor sequence quality from some of the reads. And these duplications tend to be the length of a read, in this case, the length of a packed bio read between 20 and 40 kb long, where, the, again, there's a gap here between two gray contigs in the scaffolds, which are uh, blue here. And we can see the the, the, the PAC bio reads are getting through an entire gene here with exon structure and so forth. Uh, but the bio nanodata here in purple, you can see is duplicated. And so uh, Kirsten's group recognized a lot of these in the uh, G valve evaluation. Uh, PAC bio helped us uh, fix uh, the out, uh, Falcon software to prevent some of these duplications from happening because uh, this should have not been in the primary, primary uh, contig in, in the first place. So, <laughs> Uh, what we find, as I mentioned before, is that not only the heterozygosity and the primary genome size is correlated with uh, the um, uh, genome size, but also the KMER duplications or the Busco gene duplications are correlated uh, with the heterozygosity. And when we use these purging algorithms like purge dudes and purge haplotigs to purge these false duplications from the uh, assembly, uh, from the contig or the scaffolding stages, uh, the the KMER measure duplications and the Busco gene duplications all go down, uh, including a correlation between them and repeat content also go down. Uh, so just because your number of genes is high or you think you really have gene expansion, they could also be false. You have to double check your assemblies and purge them first before you can actually do real biology. So uh, I mentioned a trio type data set. We use uh, a trio uh, uh, assembly pipeline that um, Adam Philippi's group and Sergey Karan in Iran uh, developed uh, on a zebra finch uh, to test out some of these hypotheses where we have uh, parental male data, parental female data, and sequence with uh, that short reads of the parents and sequence long reads and other data types of the child and try to do a BGP like pipeline assembly on both haplotypes separately. And uh, <clears throat> What we see here is that if we use the regular VGP pipeline with Falcon Unzip just on the child alone, we get roughly 5% uh, duplications of Busco genes in the primary haplotype and 3.3% in the alternate haplotype. But if we then use the short reads of each parent and separate out the long reads of the child and then assemble them, we see the duplications are dramatically reduced. So even without purge dudes or purge haplotids. So this is another way in which you can uh, reduce duplications and it's even more accurate uh, in terms of separating out haplotypes. Uh, what about the old assemblies? Did they have duplications? And so uh, Byung Junko and uh, Chu Li and Juwan Kim, uh, a team that worked together in Seoul National University in comparing the VGP assemblies and the two different haplotypes that were separated out from them to the old assemblies where the old assembly references exist. And in this case, the hummingbird, the platypus, and the uh, uh, zebra finch, and the uh, climbing perch. And uh, here, uh, using these new assemblies to identify false duplications in the old, we found that roughly, uh, whether it's individ individual gene or not, 21% of the genes in the prior zebra finch assembly are false duplications. 
uh, 4% in the prior hummingbird and 7.3% in the platypus, according to the new VGP reference. And there's some other false uh, type of gene models as well. Uh, that's what these uh, gray things are here. Uh, and a lot of these false implications that are haplotype specific or even sequence errors, but particularly ones that are haplotype uh, duplicate, duplications, you can identify by read depths, either with a gap or without a gap. The read depth is half uh, if there's haplotype differences between the uh, two alleles. And you can also see that in KMER plots where the false duplication has basically half the coverage of the uh, genes that are not falsely duplicated. And what uh, this team found is that in these false duplications, depending upon the assembly approach used in the old assemblies, they're roughly anywhere from uh, 16, 61% to 99% of them have a depth gap, or you know, 16% to 90% have a real gap in between uh, the false duplications. So there's something about these assembly algorithms that are putting these gaps or false sequence also uh, where there should be a gap between the false duplications. Uh, so the three biggest lessons learned here from the part that I just told you about is that haplotypes are one giant repeat and you have to take care of them. Uh, that the read lengths need to be longer than the repeats uh, with the same haplotypes to uh, correctly assemble them. Uh, and sequence accuracy and phasing needs to be high enough to prevent those false duplications from happening. Uh, and you just need to take them in consideration. Uh, and uh, so those are the false duplications. Another lesson we've learned here is false gene losses uh, that we're seeing in the prior and in the BGP assemblies as well that we had to fix. Uh, and that uh, learning that repeats and GC content are major issues contributing to those false gene losses. Uh, so here again, beginning with uh, my collaboration with Jonas, um, uh, going back to our favorite gene, SLIP1, uh, there were some losses here that we recognized, that we found after sequencing with the PAC vital data, and that the five prime uh, exon here was missing in the old assembly, which led to a miss, um, basically a um, uh, uh, error in the actual protein coding sequence uh, missing this exon here and exon 35 here. They're like uh, close to 40 exons of this gene. And so we got now the correct structure and the correct uh, exons and no false missing exons in this data set here. And we can even have whole false missing genes. So what Francois uh, Theobald Nissen, sorry, Nissen did at, who's from the NCBI team, uh, took these data that we generated from the uh, old hummingbird assemblies and the new one or the finch and the platypus, and took the same transcriptome data, plus whether it's isoseq or RNA-seq or other data types, and applied the NCBI uh, pipeline, or similar data sets it is, to um, these three uh, species and their old and new assemblies, so that there's not much difference in the underlying data that went into the annotation needle. The main thing that differs is the assembly. And looking for protein coding and non-coding genes, we're roughly getting anywhere from uh, you know, 10 to 20,000 uh, more genes uh, annotated in the new assemblies compared to the old. Uh, <clears throat> further, uh, we're seeing uh, not only within, uh, not only getting new genes, but within the genes themselves, particularly the protein coding genes here, we're getting uh, many more that are more complete. So, what Francois found using these new data sets and the new assemblies is that uh, the old assemblies had anywhere from 1,600 to 5,600 genes that were partially complete. There were partial assemblies, that is uh, uh, false losses, if you want to call them that. Uh, and the new assemblies have much fewer of these. There's still several hundred we need to fix, but still much fewer. Uh, what about RNA-seq data? Many people are using RNA-seq nowadays, and great. Uh, Jedman in my lab developed an uh, uh, isolated RNA seq uh, 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 transcriptome data from brain regions of vocal learning circuits and other brain regions of birds, mapped it back to the old zebra finch reference here uh, in pink and the new one in turquoise, and we're getting basically 7% more total mapping back to the genome. Uh, the top value here is 100%, so this is 97%, it's close to almost all the genome. I mean, all the RNA-seq data mapping back. Uh, and those mapped uniquely are also increased. 
uh, because we got rid of false duplications or we have more complete genes where we can separate out differences from one gene to another. The same thing with uh, epigenetic sequence data, ATAC seq from Lindsay Tate uh, Canteen here, where uh, total mapping is increased plus uh, the unique mapping is increased by 13%, meaning we're getting more accurate mapping uh, and understanding of the transcriptome and the epigenome from these uh, new genomes. And so we're recognizing, uh, looking at all these assemblies, there are roughly eight types of false gene losses that we've identified. Uh, we uh, group them into four types of structural level losses, totally missing genes, or exon deletions, I showed you with SLIP1, fragmented genes or rearrangements in the genes causing problems in, in annotations and gene losses, uh, to the sequence level ones where we have uh, frame shift errors, um, premature stop codons, a splice junction sequence error, which causes a false loss or ends in the coding region. And so uh, this team here from the Seoul National University analyzed these previous genomes relative to the BGP genomes. And here's the story. Relative to the uh, BGP genomes, uh, uh, in gray here is all the genes were complete in the old genomes and the new genomes. Uh, uh, and, but there was uh, sequence losses in the, uh, in the old genomes. There were structural false gene losses and totally missing genes as well, or, or, or a combination of both. And when you add them all up together, roughly 20% to 50% of the genes in the prior assembly had some type of false loss in them compared to the new assembly, uh, which is it's just astounding. I mean, it's hard to believe, but we, we check with individual genes and we can see that uh, what we predict, and I'll show you some examples later, uh, are really false losses in the old assembly. Uh, what's the cause behind these old uh, these false losses in these old assemblies, and we think in some of the new ones as well, is uh, GC content and repeat. So in uh, gray here is a plot of the GC content, uh, the genes that did not have false losses in the old assemblies, the GC content and the repeat content. And our red dots here is the plot of the percent GC in the old assemblies uh, as well as their repeat content. And you can see there's a, um, there's a lot of uh, increased repeat and GC content in these lost false genes in the old assemblies. Uh, in exon deletion, there's also a separation, not as dramatic, but all, you know, compared to the totally missing genes. Uh, what about the sequence false losses? We find that um, the repeat content and the sequence false losses aren't, isn't different between uh, in these old assemblies. But uh, those sequence false losses do have higher GC content within 50 base pairs on either side of the false loss. Uh, whether that be a frame shift error or splicing junction errors or ends in the coding regions. Uh, and so what about uh, the distribution of these false gene losses along the chromosomes? Here we have uh, the macro chromosomes of the zebra finch assemblies and turquoise and their micro chromosomes in um, uh, yellow here, and we have the circus plot where uh, mapped here's GC content is higher in red, uh, missing genes here, these little black tick marks, uh, GC content above a certain percent, of uh, 50% is red, below 50% is, uh, is uh, black, and also some division on the repeat content here. And we can see that uh, looking at these black tick marks, uh, the chromosomes, particularly these microchromosomes, with hundreds of false gene losses are very GC rich. And even in the new BGP assembly, uh, uh, there are chromosomes that were not annotated because they did not match old chromosomes of the prior assembly and we weren't sure about them. They're small ones. We have unknown chromosome names here or scaffolds that were not, we don't know if they really belong to these chromosomes or they're separate and so forth. So they, they weren't just unnamed, they were just kept unnamed. They're, but look at them, They're, all this red here and uh, GC content and repeat content and all these hundreds of gene losses in the old assembly that are now present here in this new assembly are in high GC rich, I'm gonna call them microchromosomes for now. So, uh, and here are some uh, case study examples in the new VGP assemblies compared to the uh, old on uh, top here is that here is an entire gene duplication that was given two gene names. 
uh, for this uh, SB25 gene in the uh, old assembly that in new BGP assembly is really one gene. Here are false exon duplications in the old assembly. It really has less exons in this GABA receptor here uh, that's actually specialized in vocal learning circuits of humans and songbirds. Here in the platypus gene, um, a genome, there are the vitatelogenin gene involved in egg, egg formation in platypus, all egg laying uh, animals. Uh, basically, it was split into three scaffolds with many gaps uh, between contate and annotate as two genes and no annotation here. It's really all one long uh, a contate here in the new assembly, uh, and all of the exons brought together in this very complex gene. Uh, that is now really one gene as opposed to three. And here's a gene that was not annotated at all because it's split between two different scaffolds. Uh, and now we see it's really on one uh, with no gaps uh, as one complete gene, YIPS6. And it's not just individual genes. Constantina Theofanopoulou, a, a postdoc in my lab now, in collaboration with uh, Chul, is, was analyzing uh, these genes here and found uh, not just for one gene, but some of uh, uh, favorite genes that you're studying, the vasotocin receptor, and the synteny around that, we find that compared to the old assembly, the new assembly has these genes assembled with no gaps. Uh, this is one long contig here, as opposed to three scaffolds. This large L1 can gene was totally missing in the old assembly. And not only that, almost all the genes in the new assembly are bigger because they filled in sequences in these gaps that filled in intron and exon structure that was not present in the old platypus assembly. So uh, three case studies I want to go into now on um, that we learned from these high quality genomes about new biology that, uh, that you can imagine that I just showed you in that last slide. Uh, so uh, taking off of Constantina's work, uh, what we found is we can now get better symphony between these vasotocin oxytocin receptor gene family across the vertebrate lineages. Uh, taking the highest quality assemblies we can find in the literature, plus um, their, uh, you know, uh, BGP uh, assemblies that we've generated, and we've now come up with a new model of how this receptor family evolved. An invertebrate common ancestor began as one gene we call in the basotocin receptor, uh, then it had a, a local duplication uh, on the same chromosome in the common ancestor of vertebrates, and we called it BTR1 and 2, and then there was a whole genome duplication that led to uh, uh, these two copies giving rise to the oxytocin receptor, but we really think it's a vasotocin receptor here, um, and then more segmental duplications later on, followed by losses in these various groups. And we can be much more confident about this hypothesis about gene evolution because of the higher quality symphony across uh, these genomes. Uh, another story, uh, getting back to my favorite vocal learning subject here, uh, this gene neuro D6, which regulates slit one, is also like slit one downregulated in the speech and the song areas of humans and songbirds. Uh, and here in the human brain, we can show the mRNA signal is downregulated in the speech motor cortex uh, from postmortem uh, brain, human brain tissue. And we've been looking at the regulatory regions of this gene as well as slit one, and find now with these higher quality assemblies um, and, and others, we can map back. Um, uh, the ATAC signal to them and see that there are peaks uh, in the vocal learning brain regions in the RA cell nucleus not seen in the surrounding brain circuits upstream of neural D6. And they also have accelerated evolution sequence at them that indicated they're more rapidly diverging in the vocal learning birds compared to the non-vocal learning birds. Uh, that's what this little blue tick mark here is. And we can see individual nucleotide changes uh, in the vocal learning birds, the songbirds, the parrots, and the hummingbirds, that uh, to convert this sequence into an androgen receptor binding site that uh, is not present in the non-vocal learning species. Uh, so th that's that's interesting. And what we think is going on here, this allows um, androgen receptor or maybe other receptors to bind to this newly evolved uh, a sequence that we revealed with ataxy and accelerated evolution to bind to it in the vocal learning species, but not the non-vocal learning species, to turn off neural D6, to turn down slit one, so it's not regulated in the human speech cortex, allowing certain connections to form that normally won't form. Uh, so this is work by Liz uh, Kenton. Uh, Caitlin Gilbert is also doing some epigenetic work and James Cahill in my lab. 
So uh, uh, we're also interested in how this project can help um, understand uh, and preserve a species from extinction, so conservation. So this Nicholas Doxic took the uh, kakapo genome with a team, uh, including collaborations with PacBio, uh, used this new kakapo genome of an animal called Jane. Uh, there, are only, there were less than 200 animals on the planet at the time, uh, off an uh, island called Seward Island in New Zealand here. And uh, uh, Nick and others, what we did is resequence with short reads uh, 60 other individuals from the main island, I mean, from the small island where these kakapo are at, plus the, the main island of New Zealand, and mapped it back to the uh, high quality reference of Jane that was that used pack bio data. And uh, we found that um, Stewart Island animals uh, are very similar to each other in their uh, uh, gene diversity, whereas these mainland animals. Uh, from museum samples, because the current mainland uh, uh, group of animals is extinct, they're gone. So these are museum specimens that were used short reads on. You can see they're much more divergent. And we can see that in the last ice age, 15 uh, million uh, thousand years ago, there was a decrease in the population that we estimate from looking at the genome of both mainland and uh, Stewart Island populations. But the Stewart Island populations has been more homozygous than the mainland uh, for the last 10,000 years. Uh, and so we think that this homozygosity was not just a result of human-caused uh, population decline, but something about them purged what we call deleterious alleles, that the new population, the Stewart Island population has less mutations in their genomes that would cause disease than the mainland population that's now extinct. Uh, so there's something that happened naturally here that we learned from uh, this new genome. So uh, in my last few minutes, I will now say, what is the future uh, with the vertebrate genomes project from what we've learned so far? We're going to publish a paper on those 16 genomes and use that information to move forward. We want to complete phase one of this project, roughly 71,000 vertebrate species. We want to do it in phases, 260 orders, roughly 1,000 families, 10,000 genera, 70,000 species. And uh, by completing 70,000 species, we'll complete several uh, milestones here, the G10K milestone or the Earth Bio Genome uh, Families uh, Project, the B10K Bird Project, the BAT1K, and so forth. And, and we're collaborating with all the various groups here that are interested in producing high quality assemblies uh, for these uh, questions. And so here is our mission statement. The goal of the vertebrate genomes project is to generate at least one high quality, error-free, near gapless, chromosomal level, haplotype phase, and annotated reference genome for all extant vertebrate species and utilize those genomes to address uh, fundamental questions in biology, disease, and conservation. Uh, and we set a minimum metric to have an N50 Conte, uh, we call it XYZ QV value, of 1 million base pairs, uh, and this is a um, uh, value that, that designates that for uh, three zeros, basically, uh, 10 million uh, base pair NG50, uh, two evidences of, to indicate uh, that the chromosomes are assembled or 90% of your sequences are assembled in chromosomes, and base call accuracy of QB40, and hopefully eventually on both maternal and paternal haplotype, if we can separate out the haplotypes well in the phases. And here is a table of metrics that we created. We revised the, these values because they weren't so intuitive. Uh, instead of saying 3.4, as I said in the previous slide, is to say, um, use the number of zeros to designate uh, what your N50 values are going to be. So uh, a 1 million base pair would be a 6 here, 10 million base pair would be 7. If you have perfect uh, uh, contiguity, then your NG50 for contig and scaffold is the same. And so here, I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm just showing it here since it's being recorded. You can look at these later uh, uh, to look at the details. I'll just say on a high level, we have uh, six different quality metrics broken down into 13 specific qualities that measure contigu continuity, structural accuracy, base accuracy, the haplotype phasing, the functional completeness, and the chromosome status. In the haplotype phasing, we might add something to that about how to measure uh, falsifications. And for a typical non trio VGP assembly, here are the values we've been getting any firm from 1 to 25 million base pair on the uh, contigs, 
23 to 480 on the scaffold to remind you this is influenced by genome size. And we're measuring GATS according to number of GATS per gigabit uh, to normalize the chromosome size, uh, reliable blocks that are assembled, phase blocks, and so on. Uh, and we're roughly getting 94 to 99 percent of the genome assigned to scaffolds. In the old assemblies, it was from 30 to 70 percent, by the way. So we're, we're, we're happy with what we're doing there. Uh, and whoops, and we're, we're saying also try to assemble the organelle genomes. Uh, so phase one is roughly 260 species according to divergence time of, of the different species selected going back of roughly 50 million years, which for most classification uh, taxonomists are considered orders. And that then ends up to these number of species per vertebrate group from 58 mammals to roughly 89 or 90 fish species that we're trying to sequence now. And we've collaborating with uh, the various uh, companies out there like PacBio, or Arama Genomics, Dovetail, uh, Lumina, and so forth, as you see listed here. And uh, Amazon Web Services has um, graciously uh, allow us to store the data there without egress charges uh, on a, a website now we're calling Genomark, uh, that's uh, linked to the AWS bucket. Uh, and we have a pipeline that DNA Nexus has worked into their uh, services for us, where we can take the data from the bucket, uh, take our favorite assembly algorithms, assemble it, then uh, transfer that data over to the public archives like NCBI Ensemble, UCSC, and so forth. Uh, as of to date, we have over, uh, we had two data releases, 101 genomes in September of 2019, uh, 17 that I told, talked about are 16 in uh, September of 2018. So that's over 120 species together. They're available online in the genome arc. Uh, in MTBI and so forth, and we're continuing to, to add that data there. You can access also the information about the project from the Vertebra Genomes Project website here. Uh, here is a, uh, the link to the Genome Arc website. Uh, there's a limited embargo. You can use the genomes now for publications on, on a small number of genes and so forth, and then as we publish, I'll we'll release the genomes uh, uh, for you know, all kinds of studies. But please, we want you to start using those genomes now to understand new biology, but also give us feedback about the assembly quality and what we can do to improve. The Air Biogenome Project overlaps with leadership for the VGP project, uh, and is, uh, each other is learning lessons from each other, and the Air Biogenome Project is adopting many of the practices. Uh, there's a new initiative also to redo the human genome called the Human Pan Genome Reference uh, Project, and uh, the goal here is to take roughly 350 people from around the world, uh, possibly using trios to separate out the haplotypes and assemble those individuals with, that have lots of genetic uh, diversity between each other uh, into a new reference that contains 700 genomes from those 350 people. And a lot of what we learned in the VGP pipeline and the project is um, influencing this project as well, and I'm part of it, as well as a number of people I, I told you, talked about. And so we're... Uh, <clears throat> We're up, some of this data, most of it that you just saw is going to be put out soon uh, in a paper that we're preparing uh, versus the bioarchive and the submission. Uh, here's the title here, and I just want to really give credit to all the people involved in at least this one initial study uh, uh, that's um, announcing the project. And I'm highlighting here uh, particular ones uh, that I really want to point out even more, the, uh, the coordination and lead authors here in uh, purple. Uh, those who are contributing many analyses here in red, and the company partners, uh, including PacBio and others uh, from PacBio, like Yvonne and Jonas, uh, and so on. And here I want to give a special shout out to the uh, assembly working group. Uh, uh, they've been doing a lot of the heavy lifting over the last five years uh, to get us where we are now. And, and we are, where we are now is, um, we have 120 something genomes. We just secured funding for the remaining uh, animals that we can do the, up to 260. And we're gonna be using the pipeline that this group has developed and is continuing to enhance uh, for uh, these remaining species so we can get some biology done. And with that, I will uh, stop there and you can uh, um, take notes, uh, write down your questions, and I'm looking forward to answering them when we have the open question, question session. And I thank you very much for your attention.
This conference will now be recorded.